才跟大家展示。Thank you very much. So we have seen a video in which we can see how AI can change our life in the future. We also showcase the concerns that per person have towards AI. Let's have a vote. How many of you believe that AI will bring us more good than bad? Please raise your hand. More than half of you believe that is good. All right. How many of you are skeptical? Who is more skeptical about AI? Last but not the least, how many of you are still on the fence? Can you show your hand if you think you are still on the fence? I see no hands at all. That's a very interesting survey that I can see. In fact, I live in Silicon Valley in USA. I also see a lot of people discussing about AI. And before I came to Guangzhou to attend this meeting, I attended a um, party in which I met the CEO of OpenAI, that is Sam Atman. He said that he has changed the mission of OpenAI and he changed it to feel safe and beneficial AI. So we believe that is a beginning for us to discuss more about AI. So now I would like to invite Evelyn back on the stage, and she's also being joined by two more partners. That is uh, Zhang Lu, founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund, and Tian Li, founder of Impact Investments. Certainly at the top of everyone's minds, and I would like perhaps my guests to first help us understand, you know, how would you define generative AI and the business potential? Uh, maybe let's start with uh, Zhang Lu. <coughs> oh, yeah, happy to. So you guys all know generative AI is kind of start from Silicon Valley, created such a big buzz since early this year. But actually, uh, as local investor and also as a tech leader, we've been looking at generative AI since 2021. And 2018, that's when they launched the ChatGPT 1.0. At that time, it's far from being smart in terms of using the no-code AI platform. But the, the change really happened between the ChatGPT 3.0 to 3.5. After intensive human feedback, that's when we're seeing what we have right now is a really easy to use AI platform, <coughs> be able to integrate with all different industry. So if you ask me to just identify I'll define ChatGPT with one sentence. Essentially, it's a no-code AI platform. Means all the user, everyone, don't need to write a single line of code, don't need to understand a single line of code. You'll be able to use an AI tool as ChatGPT. Great, and... Yeah, uh, you know, in the first uh, beginning way of investing AI, it's all about deep learning, uh, reinforcement learning. But right now, people more talk about uh, reinforcement learning by human feedback and uh, definitely can reduce the pre-training and uh, improve the productivity. Uh, recently, I focused more on the AI plus vertical application. I talked with actually the uh, founders and CEO before I came to Guangzhou. They told me they really changed the game. It's kind of like fundamentally game changer. For example, in the AI plus autonomous driving, AI plus design, AI plus gaming, the uh, AI model and the supercomputing really uh, change the game, and uh, we are pretty excited about the future super app in the 2C area and the 2B application. Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can expand a bit on that application <coughs> area, especially for the Chinese market. How, you know, one example of how AI might be transforming that. Yeah, and that's a good question. You know, in the last uh, three years, uh, people majorly focus on the infrastructure. So in the United States, people bet on the ChatGPT Open AI. Uh, and later, the Google, Meta, or Chisang. Uh, in China, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, people bet on the three kind of players like Baidu, Baidance, Tencent, Big Tech, and the state backed like Jipu AI, and other like uh, the startup like Minimax, uh, Moonshot, uh, by Chuan Jinan. They're almost over the one billion valuation in just one year. And that's crazy, you know. But actually, most of the investors, like my friend, they're all expecting the application. They think the application is a real game. Uh, however, people are doubt where is the real opportunity. You know, uh, in the last uh, seven years, we continue investing AI. People just uh, value AI is a super tool, the AI plus industry. But right now, we can see the game changer, as I mentioned, the AI plus autonomous driving, 
Air Plus design. Let me take an example. Um, like three years ago, I invested a company called uh, Stealth 3D. Um, I, feel, I see a lot of beautiful ladies right here. You know, if you guys are buying the clothes in the Shein or in the Temu, which is very popular in America, uh, or live streaming in Douyin, uh, we call it fast fashion. And what behind the fast fashion is flexible supply chain and AI design. Before, it all depends on designer and the model. So you have to take a beautiful photos um, and uh, uh, ask a design to write down and go to the fabric to buy the uh, raw material and go back to the manufacturer and go to e-commerce. But right now, the GPT, the mid journey, the stable diffusion really change your game. You just uh, give them an idea from A to B and it can automatically give you the hottest style. So for example, uh, if you're like a young lady, you really want to say, uh, what's the most uh, popular style in the, this winter uh, or in this, uh, in this uh, autumn? Probably give you like the, uh, the, the sporty fashion. So you don't need design anymore and you don't need the model anymore. It's a really game changer. And also for the autonomous driving, uh, I believe in the 2016, 2017, I invested in the one company called uh, Momenta. Uh, it's, uh, it's a leading player in China. Uh, in that time, people all talking about computer vision based, uh, deep learning driven. But right now the BEV plus transformer plus LL um, large language model can really improve the productivity. They can reduce the training and the increase the efficiency of the corner case. So um, I'm super excited about that. It's really game changer, yeah. Sounds like you got in quite early. Uh, Zhang Lu, on your part, what are the early trends or applications within AI that you looked at? Yeah, so uh, actually before I started VC firm, I was an entrepreneur. So at that time I had mm -hmm. my passion for healthcare already. So the reason I was early in AI is also because of healthcare. So in 2017, that's when I published the industry report in one of the largest uh, healthcare conference called JP Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco. Talk about how to leverage the power of AI and the data, be able to provide uh, we call the future of healthcare, personalized healthcare services from diagnostics to therapeutics to digital life science, digital biology. So I think that's a starting point for us to see the real value of applying AI to really help us within a specific industry, which is healthcare. On the other side, in order to show the capability of AI, we have lots of discussion about how to really train AI with a huge amount of high quality data and which industry has huge amount of high quality data, healthcare. So since 2017, we've been investing a lot of AI in healthcare uh, application. And in the past couple of years, uh, as I mentioned, we're very early on generative AI. It's also because generative AI provide a very unique value for some healthcare application. For example, uh, we have this company focused on medical imaging enhancement. We all know generative AI could generate synthetic data, which is perfect use case for this one. Think about you go to hospital, you need to sometimes take a CT scan or MR scan. You have two mm -hmm. choices, five minutes low resolution scan or two hour high resolution scan. Two hour, of course, you have more information, but it's more expensive, take very long time, low productivity. So what this company can do is, they allow you to only take five minutes low resolution scan using generative AI to upgrade your image quality to high resolution, essentially better, faster, cheaper, and also safer, lower radiation exposure, more importantly, improve the capacity for the hospital. That's a very, very, very simple example of how to use Gen AI within healthcare. And then now expand it to all different variety of application within healthcare, so you understand why not only me, lots of the big AI player in the United States and Silicon Valley truly believe AI in healthcare gonna be the biggest industry opportunity. So beyond the healthcare, there's also other vertical we've been investing. Also went back to what I initially mentioned, which industry has huge amount of high quality data and want to improve productivity, financial, insurance, logistic, manufacturing. That's all the great industry to integrate vertical AI. That's the reason we're so bullish about this trend. It might be 10 times bigger than internet because it's not only about tech industry, it's about the whole industry digital transformation. Of course, I know we've been highlighting about all the promise of generative AI. There are also lots of challenges for applying large language model. 
And meanwhile, that's also opportunity from an investor perspective. That's opportunity for investment and innovation. We are consuming too much of GPU power, right? Everyone's paying so much to NVIDIA. That's yeah. the, how we support their share price. <laughs> but there are also <laughs> lots of infrastructure technology help us dramatically reduce the consumption of GPU. Energy consumption, we use too much electricity. We also have analog devices, analog computing to reduce energy consumption by 100x. Communication issue, we have edge computing. Data privacy issue, we have data encryption technology, network security. So there are always gonna be challenges applying new technology, but I think for us as an innovator, entrepreneur, investor, we should really look at it from a different perspective to e really empower the right founder, right technology to bring application to the real life app. And I think one of the, the challenges as well is just the overall, how do you get businesses to integrate this technology, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, whether that's you know, <coughs> of their own will or of other factors. Do you have you know, any expectations for how businesses or what kind of businesses will be using this? Yeah, you want to get started? Yes, that's a pretty good point. You know, when people talk about a challenge to integrate AI to the industry, people usually talk about three things. The first is data, just like Ms. Lu said. And the, first, the second thing is uh, superpower. The third thing actually is a domain expertise. Uh, when we want, really want to integrate AI into the vertical industry, actually the, the domain expertise, the industry know-how is the key. For exactly. example, if you are really super expert in the gamma industry, in the auto industry, you can easily uh, to train your data with the AI and to know how much you want to pay for the NVIDIA, for the superpower, you know, that's pretty ex expensive. And the, the most important, you can, um, uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can serve your customer uh, in the most efficient way. So the domain expertise, the industry know-how, I think it is the most important thing. Uh, but right now, uh, uh, from my understanding, the auto industry, uh, the e-commerce, uh, design, uh, education, and the uh, marketing, I think they have the most uh, structuralist data and the most uh, uh, domain expertise, and, uh, and of course, their customer, like Baidas, like uh, Alibaba, they are super rich, so they have enough power to buy enough uh, supercomputing. So this industry I probably make pay most attention. You just want to follow up on that. If you're looking at application, are you going to look at public facing application or more business application when it comes to regulatory risk? Uh, that's a great question because, uh, you know, in China, uh, we have to pay attention to the regulation. And uh, if you talk about uh, general application, uh, for example, like a chart or like a AIGC, uh, or like uh, uh, some um, related to the public area. I think the founder will be more uh, serious and uh, because with low tolerance. For example, uh, if we have like a 90% accuracy, which means if you ask a 10 question, uh, nine is correct, one is wrong. For some area it's acceptable, like a personal assistance, or you have like a virtual girlfriend, uh, have fun with them, it's all right. But for some industry like finance, like autonomous driving, uh, like uh, legal area, I don't think it, um, it's appropriate to do that. So I think the, some industry with high tolerance will have a faster application. Um, uh, um, a I mean, the business monetization will be going fast in that area. And uh, for some industry like uh, uh, chart, uh, like uh, um, marketing, gaming, I think uh, they will face a, a less regulation and uh, have a faster monetization rate. Yeah. And we've definitely seen over the last couple months perhaps an easing in the regulatory stance. And yep. we saw Baidu and a lot of these chatbots get opened, uh, able to release to the public. And you know that's, I think, sector specific. And there's a lot of other challenges in analyzing data, especially in healthcare, as you mentioned. Have you identified a specific let's say a startup and maybe a specific area within healthcare that you're looking at even more closely? Yeah, I think one super exciting vertical I'm always looking at in the past couple of years is digital biology. You know, when we talk about digital biology, it's, only, it's not only just generative AI. Last year, there's also another quite amazed uh, AI-powered uh, solution called AlphaFold, 
really give us a database, be able to using AI to understand all the protein folding structure, basically cover all the protein we have in the human society, which is very impressive. So within digital biology, there are also specific vertical like synthetic biology. It's not only application for pharmaceutical, healthcare, but also for chemical industry, for food industry. So lots of this AI powered uh, new type of healthcare solution gonna benefit every single one's uh, real life. And I do want to quickly tackle the question you just asked about the regulation. I think essentially regulation will come and we are welcoming regulation as a Silicon Valley tech leader because we also know technology couldn't solve all the problem. But the question mark is really about should we regulate technology or should we regulate the data uh, and also essentially who used AI, right? We think AI is still as a tool. So mm -hmm. should we regulate the tool or we should regulate whoever using the tool and also the content being processing by the tool, which is the data. So if you look at the nature of the data, for example, healthcare, financial insurance, this is all highly regulated industry and the data is quite sensitive. So we should have proper regulation, work together with technology to make it um, practical and also sustainable. Meanwhile, there are also technology be able to help us solve the data privacy and the liability concern, regulation concern while we're adopting AI. One new uh, algorithm, not necessarily new, but into application, relatively new, called the federal learning. Essentially, federal learning help protect your data without physically move or transfer it. You could still share that with third party for AI model training. So I know lots of the terms that throughout are relatively new to everyone, but I just want to use this opportunity to, to let us know, let everyone know how fast the technology progress right now in Silicon Valley and how soon they will go into the commercial stage, expand it to industry. And also fundamentally, as individual user, as an industry leader, you don't necessarily need to understand all the single details of technology. The future of AI is make a very low entry point for everyone to understand. And also the goal for startup founder is also trying to not only make technology itself become cheaper, but also the integration process very easy. So we're able to design the AI solution vertical focus for different industry and be able to directly integrate into the existing workflow. I think you bring up a great point about how we should think about this new world that we're going to be entering. Exactly. And we are short on time, but I do want both of you to just sum up maybe in one phrase, you know, AI and humanity, if we're thinking about the consequences 10 years out, you know, what's top of mind for you? I could get started. So first, uh, we always need a human in the loop. So mm -hmm. AI need to power by human generated data. And another thing is eventually everyone need to make the choice. Do you want to stay authentic human or you want to be integrated with AI and <laughs> become superhuman? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting topic. You know, I, I believe everybody watch a movie called uh, Her like uh, many years ago. Uh, I believe in the next uh, maybe 10 years, 20 years, we will see a super eye like the personal assistance. Uh, it's like your AI girlfriend, AI assistant, uh, AI partner, so you can use the AI to do everything in the everywhere. I'm pretty excited about that. So in the short term, I'm I'm pretty bullish on AI trend and uh, with the human progress, especially in China right now. We really need some confidence uh, from the technology to increase our productivity and to give some um, like the forward um, power. And the long term, um, I kind of agree with the Elon Musk because w even the human is super smart, but we re really don't know how the AI going to be like the, in what kind of intelligence level. So in the long term, I probably worry about the potential AI risk to the human humanity. And uh, but in that time, I believe the super intelligence human probably have the more um, smart way to negotiate with AI and to protect us. <laughs> so so. We're, we're, we're gonna get smarter <laughs> along with the technology. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much, thank you so right. for having us. Thank, thank you. you, thank, thank you. you. Please give them a warm round of applause. Well, that was, I think, only scratching the surface of what's been happening in AI in China and, you know, even though the overall economy has been through a lot in the last several years, even this year, I think there's been a lot of concerns about the growth and future of the economy overall. But I saw a really interesting analysis from KKR uh, when one of their heads recently visited China, and they pointed out that 
even though the real estate sector uh, contracted, let's say, subtracting 3.7 percentage points from the overall GDP growth in 2022, but the green economy added 1.6 percentage points and the digital economy added 3.1 percentage points and other areas of growth added 2 percentage points. So overall, when you do the math, that brings us to the 3% growth that we had last year. And of course, many analysts are expecting real estate is going to remain the drag. And we do feel a lot of that uh, as we go about our daily lives here in China. But I think we have to remember that there's a lot of new drivers, a lot of new things going on, lots of excitement and especially in green economy. So my next guest is Richard uh, Bamakui from the New York from NASDAQ. He's the vice chairman responsible for developing Latin American and Asian Pacific markets. Please come and join me. Nice to be with All you. All right. Thank you. Good. Well. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not from the New York Stock Exchange. Yes, I'm sorry. That's right. You already I'm, had that guy. I'm, you already had that guy. I'm, I'm from so. New York, so I, I like I'm to from say New York, too. New York, but NASDAQ doesn't I'm have New York. I'm born and bred in New York. In Yes. Uh, well, NASDAQ <laughs> and uh, lots of tech focus. And I know you've. I, I always think that we, and, and we love NVIDIA. It was talked about it the last one. But NASDAQ is the home for innovative, entrepreneurial growth companies. So people say, I give you the home of technology. And w I, I would say, yes, we are the home of technology. We have the seven largest companies in the world. They're all technology companies. Uh, they're all the trillion dollar plus companies that are listed with us. But the reality is, is that we also have Starbucks and JetBlue and Walgreens and th the most amazing biotech companies in the world that are all listed with us, too. So, yes, we are the home for technology, but we're the home for, you know, companies that fit into that kind of DNA and relevant to our discussion here. I think that the next iteration for companies um, is to be focused on, uh, on, on ESG, the companies that are going to support ESG. And I, I must say to start that I think that uh, the China and the Chinese government has done a great job of being focused on this area too and, and, and holding companies here in China accountable uh, to their ESG KPIs and metrics. So maybe you can break that down for us because I know there is a lot of push for, let's say, factories or coal power plants to become more conscious about reducing carbon emissions. But what does that look like for startups? Are there exciting ideas that are only happening in China? Well, I think that startups, first of all, uh, as, as I say, and I was saying it in an interview just a few minutes ago, um, entrepreneurship is global. So entrepreneurs don't just, sit, just, don't just exist in Silicon Valley and Austin and Boston and, uh, and, and, and places that have been known for entrepreneurship uh, for years. They exist uh, here all over China. And yes, there are some fantastic companies in each of those areas, in the E, in the S, in the G, that are doing things in certainly relevant to, to here in Guangzhou. Uh, the first time I ever saw a Xiaopeng car was when I came and visited here. I saw the last time we were here, we were able to see some of the self-driving cars that were uh, being used on the streets and, you know, a credit back to the to the Guangzhou and Nancha governments that were supporting that. But, um, but overall, I think that any time that there is a shift in focus, there becomes great opportunity, great opportunity for entrepreneurs to build businesses. And we at NASDAQ sit at a very interesting intersection. We're a public company ourselves. We're an exchange operator. We own uh, 30 different exchanges. We provide technology to 130 different exchanges and provide insights uh, and, and support to them around the world. And we also own a, a platform that is a carbon uh, removal platform uh, in Europe called, called Puro and are very focused on, uh, on the, the E, the S, and the G. I think one of the things that brought me to China is we could see electric cars here and they weren't anywhere else yet. Is there something that you've seen you know, in your conversations with companies beyond electric cars? What's next in ESG? Well, 
it becomes not only the electric car, but then it becomes the the different companies that are supporting um, an electric vehicle too. So whether it's lidar or whether it's um, the battery technology that'll that'll continue to grow, I think. Um, but getting back to a, an earlier point that you made, um, I think when you start talking about coal you know, coal power plants and other things that are traditionally thought of as bad in terms of uh, in the environment, um, there becomes a tremendous opportunity when you have that focus on it. And I'll put the, the government piece aside for a second. It's really about the markets. You know, I, I guess for at some level, I speak for the markets, but in the in the U.S. investment community, we know that there is over one trillion dollars now that has been dedicated to CSR and ESG funds. So, if you start to say follow the money, that's where the money is going. And even those that don't believe it, I can tell you, um, culture is really important. Focus on different uh, different social aspects of a business are really important, and it was driven home recently. I had a, a new uh, woman join my team, and uh, we were just doing kind of a six month check in, and she said, "You know what? I wanted to join Nasdaq because of the culture that that I expected to be here and what I had heard about it from the outside. But now that I'm part of this community, I'm uh, of being working here." It really has demonstrated the fact that you guys, you know, live what you what you talk. You you walk the walk, um, not just talk the talk. And I think that that's really important. And you know, if we're doing it as a public company, we we hope that we can be leaders to to show other companies how to do it. And back to the the fundamental question you asked, which was, you know, how do how do startups do it? It's the same as as doing things on your financial side, getting your books, you know, making sure your books and records are in order from day one of any of those aspects of your business that you know, you're going to want to make sure are ready for the public markets or for a sale uh, that you want to start those from the very beginning. And so thinking about that in the context of starting your business is really important. Back in June, you told my colleague Sam Vadis that there were 65 Chinese companies that were lining up for IPOs. Where does that number stand? Uh, I think it's 116 right now that are uh, that are on, on file or that we know will be filing soon. And the the much more interesting aspect of it is now with the new process by CSRC, you all and. <laughs> Everyone in China, everyone around the world gets to see those companies that are in the process because the the way that uh, the, the new regulations have come through. We're delighted that we've had a couple of listings that have gone through the CSRC process, Adelaide Norte, Global Mofi. There's three or four that should be uh, approved in the, the near future. And I think that gives confidence to companies that uh, are interested in, in, in listing outside of China. Again... I'll, I'll put my my disclaimer out that I put uh, out all the time. My colleague uh, Chris, who leads our our uh, as our chief China rep, and I don't go all over China to talk to companies who and convince them to list in the U.S. We talk to companies who have decided that they're going to list outside of their local market, and we convince them that Nasdaq is the best place for them to list. The markets are big. Capital markets are amazing. You know, we think we are, through our businesses, are the, the fabric of the global capital markets and all the things that we do. And we're so supportive of expanding that, that pie because entrepreneurs should have access to great markets no matter where they are in the world. Yeah, and I'm wondering if you could just make that a bit more tangible. Outside of that whole electric vehicle supply chain, what is going on in ESG in China? So I think there are there are companies who are definitely doing uh, some interesting things on t on technology. Um, I think that there are even companies that are really focusing on you know their govern their governance standards. So whether it's it may not be a company that's doing it, but f to have those companies that are public either he here here in China that are li listed overseas that are focusing on raising their standards in terms of governance is really important in terms of their social impact. 
I think that that's both internally and externally really important, and besides the things that are going on on the, the environmental side, which you know, will be anything from you know, grid management to, make it, to supporting electric vehicles through that way to um, any of the other aspects of making sure that we can really reduce the carbon footprint of, of every single company. And we, we really think that it's important on the disclosure side. And so a lot of companies are doing amazing things in terms of their ESG metrics that they're following. At NASDAQ, we have uh, what we call the, the NASDAQ 30, 10E, 10S, and 10G. We put those out so that investors can, can follow them and see if we're holding ourselves accountable to them. One of the things that we've done over the past few years is buy two companies now named NASDAQ Metrio, so that all of you that are doing really the heavy lifting in terms of being focused on ESG and following certain KPIs and metrics, if you spend all that time, money, and effort, you should get credit for it. And if you don't know the ways to tell investors how to get credit for it, all the things that you're doing, then it's kind of a waste of time. So what we've done is to put together products that help you to aggregate and disseminate that information in a way that the investment community can gather it. And they gather it, they know the companies that are doing well, and then they'll look to in invest in those and take that trillion and growing amount of dollars um, in some really great companies that are focused on ESG. Just one last question, again, on the investment front. Let's say I'm an investor, I hear about tech, ESG, I don't want to invest in electric vehicles. I don't want to invest in the grid, but I know there's something exciting out there. Do you know what that is? I do, but I'm not sure I could tell you because it's usually because those things are usually pr are, are private companies and private companies that are hint? going going fast. Yes, I, I think that there are some interesting companies in in software. I think there are some real interesting companies in. Um, Certainly, you guys know all about it. We talked a little about it earlier, autonomous driving. There's the next generation of, of autonomous driving. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as we talked about grid management, I think there's, there's things in that area. And for, for this conference, may not be to your question, but uh, I think that there are amazing things that are happening in healthcare combined with your last panel, um, AI-driven healthcare um, is going to be one of the real revolutionary things that are going to happen over the next 10 years. Okay, well, thanks for giving us those tips. Robert McCooey, NASDAQ, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right, thanks, Evelyn, and thanks, Bob, from NASDAQ. Let's, let's uh, move on to talk about uh, another part that is organized by uh, from NBC Universal to NCNBC Catalyst. We are going to talk about the banking service in the Greater Bay Area in this place. We understand that this Greater Bay Area is one of the four in the whole world and it is as good as the one in New York, Tokyo, and San Francisco. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Mira Liu, the chairperson of uh, CMBC Catalyst on the stage, and he will be joined by Anthony, Ant Anthony Lin from Charter Bank. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, Chen Qian mentioned earlier, we're now at this new region called the Greater Bay Area. It's the, uh, in Guangzhou, it's the heart. This GBA initiative is a national strategic project to develop a world-class city cluster driven by economic reform, innovation, increased connectivity, and integration. If, say, back in 2017, the Greater Bay Area was still a distant prospect, Today, when we sit here for the fifth edition of the East Tech West, this is already a tangible reality. I know, Anthony, this morning you drove from Hong Kong uh, to attend this, con the, so the connectivity is already there. Chen Chen also mentioned that this economic block has a, a great potential. It's a population of more than 80 million people, accounts for 11% of China's economic output. So if GBA 
were a nation state, its GDP is already equals that of Canada and South Korea, and it is expected to grow 2.5 times by 2030. To bank on this broader GBA development story, all the financial institutions are making a beeline to establish themselves uh, in the region. And to talk about that, we have uh, Anthony Lin, who's the Greater Bay Area CEO for Standard Charter. So the fact that your institution feel the need to set up this executive role for the region says a lot about its strategic position, isn't it? Yes, thanks, Miro. Basically, you already helped me to answer the question. <laughs> you have very clearly articulate why GB is so exciting in terms of size, scale, potential, and also I think it's a very clear agenda from the um, central government. I, I think from a bank perspective, uh, we see this very, very clearly. Actually, Central Bank start to work on GB at the very beginning, since 2018. Um, and this is uh, not just a business initiative. In fact, the Bay Area is carrying the attention all the way from our global board.